Healthcare is too expensive. Employers are offsetting costs onto their employees. Who will make health benefits affordable for hardworking Americans and their families? You will. This is the Empowering Plans Podcast, a show dedicated to helping you once again emphasize the benefit in Benefit Plan. Now prepare to learn, plan, save, and protect with the FIA Group. Hello, everybody. Ron Peck, Executive Vice President and General Counsel with the FIA Group, on the line with yet another Empowering Plans with the FIA Group podcast. To my left, okay, that's not really true. I'm actually calling in from my basement office, and to my left is nothing but empty space, and to my right is nothing but empty space. I don't know why I had to have that moment of honesty when nobody can actually see me, but I wish to my left was sitting the triple P, the triple threat, the man, the myth, the legend, Pat, the podcast producer, Pat Santos, and to my imaginary right, I can see you now, Brady. I can see you. I can hear you. But those are the only senses that I want to tap into when it comes to you. All others, will just leave that alone. Brady Bizarro. Brady, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing just fine, Ron. Just you know, fine. there was a moment of hesitation. You had to really think about it. I'm going to I assume did. that you were really doing some kind of self-assessment. You know, like, where am I? How am I feeling today? I don't want to mislead Ron. He can't see me. So the only thing he has to base his decision upon are my words. So those words better be accurate and true. And I appreciate that. Brady, it's almost the weekend, buddy. I know one day leads into the next. It's all blur. And when it comes to the weekend, you know what I like to think about? What's that? I like to think about threats to the industry, Brady. Nothing gets <laughs> me more relaxed and ready for, you know, pina coladas in my backyard than thinking about threats to the industry. And you know what kind of threats to the industry that I love the most, Brady? Catch 22s, buddy. Catch 22s, you know? Other people are catching other things, but I'm catching 22s. And what do I mean by that? We are dealing with a situation that I think is in many ways the perfect storm, Brady. And I know you and I have been talking about this a lot. On the one hand, you have a major health crisis in our nation and in the world. And when there's a major health crisis, it screams out for heroes. It screams out for inventors and innovators. It screams out for people who are going to put rubber to the road and invent new medical devices, new drugs, vaccines, right? I mean, Moderna, there's a whisper that their vaccine's looking good and their stock price doubles. That's what I'm talking about, right? I've said it before. I'll say it again, right? Necessity is the mother of innovation. And here we go, right? Mother of invention. We've got these people inventing these new services and drugs. And why, 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 why are they doing it? Two reasons. One, they want to save the people, right? They got to save us from the disease. Bless you. The other reason, because if you're the first one to market with the Holy Grail, you're going to make bank. And that's why those stock prices are doubling. Not because they're heroes, but because they're going to make bank. Well, for them to make a lot of money, what else needs to be true? That somebody else is paying a lot of money got to come from somewhere, Brady. So when I talk about a threat to the industry in a catch-22, I'm looking at these situations that are calling out for potentially very expensive treatment, potentially very expensive care, right? And the question that then begs is, who's going to pay for it? So on the one hand, I'm looking at the situation, I'm saying, I can't wait till they come out with a vaccine so I could take my kid to the Lego store at the mall but on the other hand, I'm thinking, but it's going to be expensive. And my clients, these benefit plans, and frankly, my own plan that we self-sponsor, right, that we self-fund, are going to have to pay the cost. But then you're going to tell me, but Ron, this is a national crisis. This is an international crisis. The government is going to step in. They're going to subsidize. They're going to put caps on what these providers can charge. We're going to figure out a way to make these vaccines affordable. And as someone who's an employer, and represents these benefit plans, I take a, a sigh of relief, right? Oh, thank goodness, Brady, you're right, as always. But here's my concern. If and when the government steps in, whether we're talking state or federal, and they start to subsidize the cost of care, they start to purchase health care for individuals, right? Vaccines, treatment, et cetera. They foot the bill. 
and that's for people other than Medicare and Medicaid recipients. Does that take us one step farther? Does that take us a little bit closer to making people more comfortable with government provided health benefits? So you can kind of see the catch 22. Either I'm going to foot the bill myself, don't go anywhere near government money, private health benefits have got it, baby, but that's going to cost me a lot. Or, you know what? I'll take that government handout, send it this way. Oh, wait a second. I just took us one step farther towards Medicare for all. When I think about that threat, Brady, I think we need to really define what the boogeyman is, right? We have to define what's causing this catch-22 to exist in the first place. And you, like I, have been thinking about threats to the industry, thinking about threats to our pocketbook, and have identified some of the biggest cost threats that we're looking at today. Am I right? You're right, Ron. You know, I think the cause to most of these catch-22s, if I had to summarize it in one word, I'd say it's politics. And that's exactly what we're looking at today. And even though we're in July, we do have an election coming up in the fall. And I think all the issues you just described, Ron, about the intervention of government, the slide toward Medicare for all, a lot of those issues could be decided this November, depending on who wins. Because you have one candidate who's being pushed by the left to adopt a lot of policies where the government steps in and does take care of your health insurance costs and does mandate that employers bear the burden of paying for treatment of COVID-19. And that candidate, of course, is Joe Biden. On the other side, with President Trump, if he wins, I think you're a lot less likely to see the slide toward government public option health insurance. And so we'll have to see how that plays out. But there's a couple of issues that play into what you described that I think will be decided no matter what happens this fall. And one of them, I mentioned on our webinar back in July, but it's the fate of the Affordable Care Act itself, because what you've got going on is a thousand cuts, right, being applied to the ACA over the past couple of years. And one candidate saying that he's going to restore it back to its original glory. In fact, he's actually going to expand upon it, make it better. And the other candidate, President Trump, who is basically saying, look, it's about time we repeal and replace. Finally, we have this court case that we want to go our way, and we're going to replace the ACA with something much better, something maybe Trump care. But in the middle of the pandemic, The problem I see, Ron, is that you have record numbers of people losing their employer-sponsored coverage because they're losing their jobs. So for every one additional person who loses their health insurance because they lost their job, you see a louder chorus growing of people saying, look, we can't have people go without medical care. The government has to step in and provide them with care. And there's a couple of options for how you can do that. Either you can extend, which is I think the option that we prefer in our industry, is extend COBRA for these people by having a government subsidy to keep these people on their employer's health plan because hopefully these people get hired back in their jobs in a few weeks. If you don't do that, though, what you have on the other side is a call for a public option, a sort of stopgap government insurance plan where all the people who lost their health insurance in the middle of this pandemic will get scooped up and put on some government plan. And that would be exactly what we don't want to see happen because it would lead us one step closer to a public option and then maybe to Medicare for all. So we're kind of in a bind there as well, that we've got to stop the slide of people losing their health insurance when they lose their jobs. You know, Brady, it's wild because as you're talking, I'm really thinking about, and I won't go into too great detail, but I recently dropped a dish in my kitchen and it hit the ground and it shattered and no amount of Gorilla Glue was going to save that thing. So into the trash it went. That dish was not insured. I don't purchase insurance for my dishes, despite the fact that there's a risk that they're going to be destroyed. At the same time, you know, I do purchase insurance for my automobile because like the dish, if it gets smashed, you know, and it's a loss, I want to be compensated for the value of the loss. And so that naturally begs the question, why am I purchasing insurance for the car, but not for the dish? And the answer is obvious. Because the cost of the loss on a dish is something I can bear, you know? You're not talking about that much from a monetary standpoint. But an automobile is a much more expensive item and therefore a much greater loss. And so as you're talking about who's going to pay, where am I getting benefits, right? I've lost my job. Do I get extended on COBRA, remain on my plan? Do I join a government plan? Is the government providing benefits? Is the government paying for me to get benefits elsewhere? 
all of these discussions and all these arguments presume, right, just take for granted that health benefits, health care, is more like the car and less like the dish, and that it's expensive. That's a given. And because it's so expensive, you can't afford to go uninsured. And it makes me think, if we're going to be spending tax dollars, if we're going to be spending government money to deal with the high cost of health care, you could do it in more than one way. You could do what we're talking about, which is to either extend COBRA, so keep them on the private plan, or create a government plan, right, or extend Medicare for all, whatever, which is using government funds to purchase insurance or provide benefits. But couldn't you take the same money, use it to subsidize and reward, really, the healthcare provider, the ones that are innovative, the ones that are first to market with a vaccine, and in exchange for that reward, you cap the cost of that health care from the provider end of the equation so that health benefits yeah. are more affordable from the plan side. I just think it's interesting that we automatically, the knee-jerk reaction is the government should buy me insurance or the government should pay for new insurance. So I should have government insurance or private insurance paid by the government so that I could then pay whatever amount the provider charges instead of I could afford private insurance if the government were reducing the cost of that thing insurance pays for. And before I hand it right back over, using my example, if that automobile that I'm currently insuring is worth, let's say, $35,000, if there was a government fund that basically chips in $25,000 for a car for every American man, woman, and child, would I need insurance to cover the other 10000 Maybe not. Maybe I'd be willing to pay out of pocket. So I do think it's fascinating that instead of asking the government to pay for auto insurance, if instead I had them pay uh, to keep the cost of the car down, I could afford the insurance myself if I even wanted it. So it's just interesting to see that in that equation, payer and payee, we're always focusing on who's going to pay instead of how much are we paying the payee. Yeah. And you know, Ron, you know what plays right into the example you just gave that's playing out right now with coronavirus, and that is the price of this treatment called remdesivir, right? So you mentioned how when the government's providing a fund or money to manufacturers to say come up with a, a vaccine or a treatment, we should be looking for them to put a cap on prices or at least, you know, looking for some concession on the provider side or the drug manufacturer side. Well, that's not happened so far with this drug treatment for remdesivir, which is at the moment the most promising treatment for COVID-19 because taxpayer dollars were used for funding, the research needed to come up with this drug by Gilead Sciences. But unfortunately, when they released the drug, they priced it at $520 per vial or over $3,000 for a five-day course of treatment, which is actually pretty high considering how much money they got from the government to come up with the treatment to begin with. It's also much higher than they're charging the government itself. And they're charging every other country in the world a lot less. So here you have an example of a drug manufacturer that is not really, in many people's opinions, stepping up to the plate here and lowering the prices that they should by having received government money. And it kind of plays into a broader point. We made this point in our webinar as well, but I, I want to reiterate it here because a lot of our clients, a lot of plans, the top driver of costs for them is drugs. And we've been looking for the federal government to act on drug prices for a long time. We've covered some of the court rulings that have come down about, you know, do manufacturers have to list their prices in TV ads? The answer to that question is no at the moment because the administration doesn't have the authority to do that. But one of the things that the administration did do, which will provide some relief for plans and for others in the industry, was this new rule on copay assistance. And we've talked about this a lot, and we could have really two or three podcasts about this issue. But just basically, many of our clients will know or be familiar with copay accumulator programs, where basically a manufacturer providing an expensive drug gives a patient a coupon that's valued at maybe $500 or could be thousands of dollars depending on the drug. And what tends to happen is the plan is not really aware when the patient is using this copay card or this coupon. And so when the patient cashes out for their you know, $1,000 drug, the entire amount is applied or being applied to the patient's maximum out of pocket which means that the patient hits their max out of pocket pretty quickly. And then the plan is on the hook 
for that entire amount of the cost of the drug for the rest of the year. And what the administration has done in the last few months, in the last few weeks, actually, just they finalized this rule, is they're now giving plans the option of whether or not they want to apply that copay amount to a patient's max out of pocket. Because the thinking is that when these manufacturers are offering these very tempting coupons for hundreds of thousands of dollars, they're really steering patients to choose more expensive brand name drugs when they have generics available in many cases. And so this is an example of a small regulatory change that's going to have a big impact on prices because it's going to disincentivize the use of these coupons when there's a generic version of a drug available. And it's going to mean that coupons, as we know, or as many articles written about how manufacturers will artificially inflate the price of their drug and then offer a massive coupon as a way of really gaming the system. And that's an example of, I wonder if we can apply that or if the government can apply that when there eventually is a COVID-19 vaccine. And we know that plans have to pay for it because of the CARES Act. Will there be some kind of manufacturer assistance? How will the government treat it? All questions that we need resolved and kind of throw us back into the same catch-22 because we do want some government support, but not too much. So you mentioned a couple examples of you know high cost services, drugs, things that are kind of coming down the pike where this is going to be so relevant. And with the last five minutes, you know, I wonder if you could make us a little bit more aware of some of the other you know, major threats that you see either in the courtroom or in the laboratory that are going to impact us where this is particularly relevant. Yeah, I mean, so in terms of the threats, it seems to me that the biggest threat is going to be what happens with the ACA, because one of the most expensive things for, as we, as we know, for plans and frankly for employers to deal with is uncertainty. And we've been covering for, it feels like years now, it has been years, whether or not the ACA will be repealed. Many big parts of it have been repealed already. We know the individual mandate has been rolled back. We know that changes were made to the ACA section 1557, which impacts plans that are covering benefits for those who are transgender. There was just a big Supreme Court ruling on the contraceptive mandate case, which now says that employers are no longer obligated to cover the cost of contraceptives if they have a religious or moral objection to doing so. But there's a lot more questions being raised by this. The ACA itself is still being litigated at the Supreme Court, and we won't have an answer until next term, which could be next summer even, on whether or not the ACA is repealed. But for plans, they've got to know, right? I mean, how can you operate a plan? The biggest healthcare law by far in our lifetimes, or certainly mine at least, is the Affordable Care Act. So if you're going to repeal that law, at least for me, it's either you know do it or not at this point because we've been teetering around this issue for years with these replacement plans that never get passed or with these court cases that keep getting drawn out. But employers need to know what parts of the ACA are going to stand. What essential health benefits do they have to offer so that they can know how much it's going to cost to administer health benefits to their employees? I see that as a top threat, along with, again, the looming specter of Medicare for all. And finally, I would say this, in the middle of the pandemic, We've mentioned how millions of people are unemployed and many of those people have lost their insurance. The calls from the left uh, and some on the right, frankly, that have pointed out, you know, this is a great time to decouple health insurance from employment. That's another top threat that we have to be careful of. It's exactly why it's a good idea for our industry to be supporting things like a COBRA subsidy or extension, because if you can keep employment and health benefits tied together, now more than ever, then you will quiet those voices down on the other side. Because there's a big temptation for people to say, look, this is a great time for Medicare for all. People are losing their coverage. We have a pandemic raging. And so I think that's a serious threat as well. And hopefully, hopefully the economy doesn't get too much worse and, and recover as quickly so people can get back on their plans. And we don't see the kind of calls that we're seeing now for a public option. You know, Brady, that's a great point. And I think that is a call to action. And at the same time, you know, if you think about it, before COVID-19, before the pandemic, even before this idea of Medicare for all, you have people, Americans that are on Medicare, are on Medicaid, and prefer a private benefit plan, either one that they once were on or one that they eventually return to. And that kind of, you know, that makes me think, why? Why? Why would somebody who was on Medicare later say, you know, I was on Medicare, I found gainful employment, or I was on Medicaid rather, and I, you know, I found gainful employment, or I had an opportunity to join a private plan. And, you know, I prefer
prefer this plan that I'm on. And I think even the Obama administration that promoted the ACA, you know, you remember, and whether you believe it or not, whether you think he was being honest or not, you recall, he said, for people who like their plan better, they can stay on their plan. For people who like their doctors, they can keep their doctors. You know, this idea of Medicare for all, who wants it? There is a general sense that for many people, they do prefer their private plan. Why? Why? What makes your private plan better than a Medicare for all plan? Better than a public option? Because ultimately, anytime it comes down to making a decision, you're going to have a cost benefit analysis. And that person who's making that decision, they're going to compare the costs, but they're also going to compare the benefits. So when it comes to our plan, if you feel like you cannot defeat Medicare for all, a public option, as far as cost is concerned, what can you do to beat them when it comes to benefits? And our level of flexibility, customization, innovation, I think that's where our strength lies. So even as people lose their jobs, lose their employment-based benefits, and look for another option, there will be a place in the future for employment-based private benefit plans as long as those plans offer something that the other options don't offer. So it's not just about knocking the competition, but increasing the value of your offering as well. And there's a great opportunity there. And I know we're working with our clients to make sure that regardless of whether you're in today or a future where Medicare for all exists, even when Medicare is available to everybody, they'll still pick your plan because you're offering something the government can't. And that's, I think, something we need to keep our eye on. Amen. With that said, guys, I appreciate it. I appreciate you spending your Friday afternoon with me. As always, be well, be safe, take care of each other. And thank you to everybody for listening in to another episode of Empowering Plans with the FIA Group. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Be well, be safe, stay cool. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much.